Good morning, guys. Another episode of the Breakdown Rugby Podcast. We're here with Tali Wanashi Kemwendo, Brian Chatterjee, Kieran Williams for the world's greatest rugby show. Back again after a scintillating semi final. South Africa taking the W. Lads, initial thoughts before we get into our analysis of the game. Gutted, absolutely gutted. I think, um, I mean, I was saying it to you before we started recording. I think I'd rather see us lose by more and never have a shout at winning the game than lose in the last minute and think and believe that we can win. Yeah, I agree. I think, um, look, 32-12 in 2019 rang around my ears for years, for four years. And now we're going to hear 16-15 for the next four years. So it's going to be hurt. And I, I, like Brown said, I'd rather lose, get battered by 50 points to take the L than I would lose by a point because it's just, it hurts more that we lost by a point. And we were in the driving seat the whole game. Yeah, yeah. No, I completely agree. I think first thing to talk about, <clears throat> first half, England get that penalty really early. And I don't know what it was for that first 40 minutes. England just didn't have to play right. Like, they, they just were happy to kick, put pressure on staff, can get penalties. But were you guys... Did you guys go into that game know that Baldwick was going to go with that sort of style of rugby and know, you know what, we can do this and try and play off the South African mistakes and stuff and try and force errors from South Africa? Um, I don't think I don't think it was uh, playing off South Africa's mistakes. I think it was creating situations where South Africa are uncomfortable. I think mm-hmm. you look, yeah. you put a lot of pressure on that line out early on and South Africa didn't have any answers for it. In terms of the high ball, Normally, Colby and Arenza are very good under the high ball, but under experienced players like Johnny May, Elliot Daly, they just weren't they weren't getting any gain from any any high balls. We were winning everything. So I think South Africa were very uncomfortable. We made it awkward and we were just animals. Yeah, I completely agree with everyone. I think they put... I think we firstly saw South Africa for the first time in years be put under stress in a big competition like that. Yeah. They were uncomfortable. Uh, they were put under pressure. And I think we saw that with Razzie's Razzie's decisions to bring Libok off, Ebenezer off after forty minutes. Like he looked like he was under pressure and he didn't know where to turn. So I think with England wrestled them very early on. They went to their set piece. England in the first half had a better set piece than South Africa did. Let's get that really, really crystal clear. They had they they were on it. Uh-huh. They wrestled them. They put them under pressure. And Owen Farrell was steering the ship beautifully. And then it switched. Just what you said with that Manny Libok thing. I don't know what that's going to do for his confidence. I think we're going to go five three next game. But with, with Pollard starting, maybe Este isn't on the bench because Manny Libog, to be bought off at 30 minutes, it, and I love him. I, I still I'm still gonna I'm still gonna believe in the, the future Carter hype. I've I've said this before from Dado, I'm not gonna turn on him now, right? But what's that gonna do to his confidence to get subbed off like that in probably his worst ever performance? I, I think now it, it comes down to is what what type of person is he? Is this a sort of thing that's going to make him more driven, more motivated to perform? Or is he going to go into his shell? I think if I was Razzie, I'd probably put him on the bench for the final. And he's there if you need him. But but just go with Pollard. Pollard's going to be the main man that's going to kick your points against New Zealand. And Libok, if you need to score tries, he's there on the bench. I think Razzie should listen to me months ago. I, I told it ages ago. I said Limbok is a wasted position on that pitch. Yeah, and right. why select him? Why, why select him 30 minutes into a game to drag him off like a little cat, get him dragged off the pitch? Sorry, I'm not being funny, but they, why why start him? If you're not going to play him, if you don't have confidence in him and he, and he can't play in certain conditions and he cracks under pressure, why play him on the pitch? He is not. I said he was a bottle job and he is a bottle job. Yeah, I, I think the best way to, to look at it and compare the two is when Libox on the pitch, Razzy feels like he needs to uh, deliver messages onto the pitch using the lights, using the water boys, whatever, because he doesn't feel that Manny Libok as a 10 can drive his team forward and can make the right calls in the right areas of the field. When Pola, you contrast that when Pollard's on the pitch, you have someone that's going to... look. You saw, what, you saw when one of the players called the mark, Pollard slowed the game down, brought everyone in, gave them in clear instructions. That's what you get from Pollard. You don't get that from Libok. I said Pollard. Pollard was the guy to come on. He was the guy. He was the veteran to come on and and, and just compose everybody. For me, Manny Libok should never even play for South Africa again. <laughs> Sorry, getting dragged <laughs> off, getting dragged off in a semi final is unforgiving. It's unforgiving, and the fact that the coach had to do that shows he has no confidence in him, and yeah, and he lacks huge ability in big games. So for me, Manny Libok should never put the Springbok jersey it shit on again. For me, it was more so the rain than anything else. I think you're looking at it and saying if if it wasn't raining. Manny Libok would flourish in that game, and I'm going with Manny Libok in the final, and I'm coming with Pollard off the bench. But just to move the topic on, right, uh, before we move on to why Slavka won the game, I want to talk about England and some of the dogs England had. George Martin, Maro Toje, 
Courtney Laws, Dan Cole, Joe Marler. Those guys, in terms of the South African set piece, I'm not sure if you noticed, right? As soon as they came off and Ox and Che came on and Genj and Carl Sinclair came on, England set piece crumbled. I've said it for months that Genj and Sinclair aren't scrummagers. You take off Jack, uh, Cole Marler's, everything crumbled. But how important were England's forward pack in matching that physicality battle? How well did they do? You know, it wasn't even just about matching the physicality. I think we took it to a different level. I think we almost shell shocked. Um, yeah, we were. We, we put South African forwards into their shell with a, with our physicality. George Martin, a player that a lot a lot of people don't know a lot about, came out on a semi final and took it to South Africa. Just dominance, physicality at the gain line, and we just we just shook South Africa. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, for me, it was even when Elliot Daly is just absolutely mullered. Um, Dwayne Vermeulen, like he smoked him, and you're thinking this is a winger smoking an eight. Like England, for me, took their energy levels and their psychology to a whole different level that South Africa would not prepare for. And I think England, like like Rowan said, shell shocked them. And I think there was a it, with England, they tired. I think they tired after about 50 minutes, and then when that bomb squad came on, that real bomb squad, and Game. Sinclair got absolutely outscrummed. I can't believe him. He turned his hips in. He wasn't prepared for it. I don't understand the selection round. I would, I would have wanted to see a Will Stewart coming and out and out scrummager. For me, that would have been better. But with Sinclair, he's, he crumbled. He crumbled. Okay, okay. Think... Maybe if the Bath bomb squad was there, then um, it would have been more secure. Better Urbano. Say what you want. Say what you want about Bath's front row. If they come off the bench in that game, I think I think we deal with the scrums a lot better. And, I, and I'll take it back to Borfick. I think Borfick's game plan for this game was amazing. He did everything right in terms of the way we want to play. Two things I think he got wrong was the selection from the start of the World Cup, not including Zach Mercer, not including Mercer something. Huge. Yeah. Uh, and having Billy Vanapola come on and then defend the tail of the line out for the South Africa try, that was that was a terrible decision. Other than that, I think Borfwick got everything right, but you can't have someone like Billy Vanapola who is immobile defending against a very mobile hooker like Dion Fari at the same final. This, this, this is what happens when Billy Vinopoulou, who hasn't played rugby in the last year because he's an injury prone, comes on, he's so immobile, knocks it on, then he then he concedes pretty much England's try where he, he, he just plants his feet. And then later on when he comes back on, he knocks it on again. That was his highlight reel. That was his game. And that to me, why start him? Why? You've got Zach Mercer, pro 14 player of the season, Literally in fine form, never you're probably going to see one of the best eights in world rugby. You don't select him, you start an immobile one, you lose a game. Borthwick has to take responsibility for not playing some of the key players that are in world rugby that he's not selecting. He has to take responsibility for that. In terms of before we move on to why staff can win the game, just a quick one on Borthwick. Are you guys happy to have Borthwick as full time coach now? I'm still saying if you can get an Ogara, you go for an Ogara. But has Borthwick now done enough to say, you know, I deserve to be coach? Because I'm very much like, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think he has, yeah. I think he's a good he's a good coach to have at the moment. When you look at the other coaches that are available to England, we don't have an Ogara available. We don't have a Razor available anymore. We, we missed that opportunity months ago. So now we have Borthwick. And if I'm honest, I think he's done a lot better job than everyone thought he would do. And and we got to remember as well, he's not an experienced international coach. He he will learn a lot from games like that against South Africa. He now knows that players like Vunapola should not be defending that area. He now knows that if you're playing against a South Africa team with a bomb squad, you need front rowers on your bench that are going to be able to deal with that. Yeah, I think he's very early in his career. And I think, let's not forget, he had 12 days before the Six Nations to go into a team that were low in confidence and he's dinner where to turn and he's turning around and taking to a semi-finals of a World Cup within eight months. This is That is impressive from Steve Borthwick. And like Rowan said, he's early on in his career. Give him another World Cup cycle and I can see England genuinely winning a World Cup and it's not crazy yeah. to say. And Borthwick is the guy. I'm going to... I fully back on this podcast Borthwick to take us forward. Um, well, just before we move on to the player ratings, why did, why did what made South Africa win that game? Because for me, at the 66th 60, the 60, 60 minute period, I was getting ready to make my apology TikToks to all the England fans. I, I was genuinely like thinking, okay, what photo am I going to use? All of that. But Pollard comes on, takes the big kick. Obviously, the Snyman try happens. But why? what happened to England? I think it was the rest. Was the bomb squad for me. The rest? Kieran, Ben O'Keefe was biased against South Africa that entire game. Every call that was going no. against. Us. Hands in the ruck from England. Itoji not rolling away, holding our players in. 
Quagga Smith over the ball for five, six seconds and he's not calling it. We were lucky to win that. I disagree. I think the ref gave you the game. He gave you a ticket into the World Cup final. I really do. The whole the scrum penalty that Pollard kicked over, Ellis Gensh hips did not fold in. And the fact is, that the ref doesn't know what he's doing there. He's very incompetent and he needs to be looked at. He, Ellis Gensh hips did not fold in. South Africa got the penalty. They won the game. He, there needs And what annoys me the most is that the TMO should be sitting in there saying, you got that decision wrong, overturn it. The fact is, the pressure was on his shoulders. The ref did not pull through the right decision. And now Polos slotted over, we're out. So there has to be an element of the ref in there. I, mean, I think in terms of the scrum, I think there's a lot of like dark arts going on that we're not aware about in terms of like, we we don't have a good view of the scrum. I mean, for, yeah. for one of the scrums, it looked like Ox and Shea was hinging, went all the way around Sinclair and, and went in from the side. But... I mean, we we had the penalty conceded against us, so I don't really understand what was going on there. Because what what I know about scrums, that's a penalty to England. So I think there's a lot going on. And then you heard Jamie George on the mic talking about um, South Africa are going too far to the left. So there's a lot going on that we we're, we're not aware of. So it's hard to say that the refs got it wrong. 